Well, what can I say? It's another episode of In Conservation With. Um, my name is David Lindo. Um, this is all sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. And I have with me Kirsty Franklin, who will be talking to tonight to us about um, seabirds. But before you start telling us about that, just quickly, how are you and where are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, and I'm in Norwich, which is in Norfolk in the United Kingdom. United Kingdom, <laughs> no less. Um, you are a 26 year old seabird biologist uh, and also a birder based in Norfolk. And you're currently doing a PhD at the University of East Anglia, uh, focusing on the breeding and migration ecology of tropical seabirds, of a tropical seabird even found in Mauritius, which is known as the Round Island Petrel, which to be honest with you, I never really heard of. But anyway, you are a keen science communicator. You believe that social media is not only a powerful tool for disseminating seabird research uh, to a wider audience, but also a way to encourage more people to get connected with nature, which is really interesting because I really think that, um, you know, the, the, the internet is quite a, I mean, it can be a cesspit, of course, especially places like Twitter, but it can be very, very fascinating as a, as a tool. Now, how, let's tell, tell us about yourself a little bit more. How did you get into this whole world of birds and natural history? Uh, yeah, so I grew up in Cornwall, um, which is quite a nice place to be. Um, so I've always been quite interested in wildlife and nature. Um, but it wasn't really until I did my undergrad degree in Cardiff that I was introduced more into birds. Um, I actually started doing some work on primates in Borneo. Um, and then it was in my final year that I did a research project on uh, passerines. So I was ringing uh, great tits and blue tits, and it was actually like handling these birds that really got me excited and interested in learning more about them. And then it was just the experiences from there that I was very luckily provided with being able to work with seabirds. But was there a moment, I mean, uh, you know, was there some sort of explosive moment when you suddenly realised, you know, this is what I want to do? Was there an initial thing that kind of kicked you off? Uh, mainly for seabirds, it was when I was working with um, storm petrels in Portugal, and it was holding those and being like, you've travelled from the bottom of the um, African Ocean, and you've come all the way up past Portugal, and you're going to carry on going up to the North Atlantic, and you're tiny. And it was just mind blowing. I wanted to learn more about where they were going and what they were doing. Okay. And before then, were you interested in nature? I mean, yeah, yeah. Before then, I was, but as I said, it was more like generally rather than anything specific. Okay. So, what what got you into actually working in this field? Um, mainly through like my supervisors in Cardiff, um, just providing me with the opportunities there, like going to Portugal, going to Skokum Islands, a really nice seabird island off the coast of Wales. Um, yeah, just general opportunities, really. Okay. Um, just to uh, let you know, but Sean, Sean Moore actually got the answer right regarding my backdrop. This here is actually a, a Scopoli's, Scopoli's Shearwater. Uh, which I took a picture of when I was in uh, the Mediterranean somewhere. So just as an aside there. Okay, so um, so you are really interested in, in being a communicator, especially for seabirds. What do you think most people's general view of seabirds are? Um, I don't really know how many people know much about seabirds, like the general public I think they're I don't know probably the people here might prove me wrong um yeah I'm not really sure <laughs> I mean does your mum know much about seabirds uh not a huge amount um only more recently when I started um getting into them um I think I was the one who introduced her to most seabirds and in terms of seabirds generally are you are they the kind of main 
family of birds that you're interested in or is it birds in general but you just have to be working on seabirds at the moment uh yeah birds in general um particularly migratory birds um but seabirds is my main interest okay and what do you do when you're not looking at seabirds um normally ringing birds <laughs> and i can't do those uh or i can't be ringing seabirds all the time um normally out walking with my binoculars it's all quite nature based really okay and what do you where do you like going what have you got local patch in norwich uh i have a patch behind my house which has been really good for during lockdown um seeing as we can't travel very far but anywhere near the coast really is where i'd normally prefer to go to okay um and how's how's lockdown been for you how have you found this whole pandemic how, how have you coped okay I think um, I'm quite lucky in the fact that I've been able to carry on with my PhD and work which I know lots of people haven't been able to um, and I live in quite a green area Norwich in general is quite good for its green spaces so I've been lucky to get outside and enjoy the nature okay well you know seabirds I suppose are an excellent uh, indicator of the health of uh, the, the marine environment basically in a nutshell how is our marine environment doing these days um not great it depends on um where you're looking i guess um in the uk there'll be certain species or certain colonies that are doing a lot better than others um there's quite a lot of threats to seabirds fisheries Invasive predators, quite a big one. You've seen anything coming from Gough Island recently. Um, so yeah, not great. And there's a lot that we can do to learn more and hopefully help conserve them. And do you tell people, you know, when people talk about seagulls, do you describe them as seabirds or do you think they're sort of uh, coastal or even inland birds now? Yeah, more coastal and inland. And I try not to correct them and say they're not seagulls. <laughs> I try they're not, not like me then. I'm always on people's backs. Always. <laughs> so you try not to correct them? No, I try not to, just because I don't want to be that person. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're going to talk, you're going to show us your talk shortly, but um, I don't know if this is covered in your talk, but I just wanted to know what the main difficulty was when it came to assessing the numbers of seabirds, because you often hear about particular species that have disappeared, supposedly, and in the next minute, they're rediscovered, you know, nesting somewhere else, and actually sometimes in large numbers. I mean, there's one particular seabird I've always wanted to see, which is the blue petrel, which is, um, you know the blue petrel, do you? It's actually, um, or was, found in the Blue Mountains, I think. Is that right, of uh, Jamaica? Or maybe it's a Jamaican petrel I'm thinking of. No, the Jamaican petrel. Um, I've always wanted to, to find out because it nests in the mountains away from the sea, or oh, used to. And the last time it was seen physically was back in the late 1800s. And, you know, it's one of those sort of, for me, one of those mysterious birds. That, you know, if I was a mountaineer, I'd be climbing that mountain, looking under every rock to try and find that bird. Yeah, there's um, one species of storm petrel, I think it is, that's been recorded to nest in the desert, um, which is pretty crazy, really. They are a fascinating family, aren't they? I'll tell you, what, why don't you take us through your, your talk and then we can, uh, you know, we can sort of talk about it afterwards. Yep, sure. I'll start, start sharing my screen now. So remember, Zoom is to go on to uh, speaker mode and you'll be able to see all of it. Can you see it all okay? We can see it, yeah. Oh, should I go? <laughs> there you go, you're away. Cool, yeah, so as most of you probably know, I'm gonna be talking about virtual bird counting. Um, and this is on my PhD study system, which is the Round Island Petrel. And the virtual bird counting is called something through Seabird Watch, uh, which I'm gonna to touch on in a minute. Um, so yeah, as uh, David said, I'm doing my PhD at the U at UEA in Norwich. But first, I thought I'd give you a little background to Round Island. 
um, just in case some of you haven't heard of Round Island or you're not sure where it is, uh, Round Island situated 22 kilometres off the north coast of mainland Mauritius. So you can see from the image, it's quite a steep uh, volcanic island. It's really difficult actually to go anywhere where you're not walking either up or down. It's quite, quite tiring. Um, and Round Island was designated as a nature reserve in 1957 and is administered jointly um, by the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation and the National Parks and Conservation Service, which is the Mauritian government. And Round Island is really interesting. Um, it was denuded of much of its vegetation by introduced rabbits and goats. Um, these uh, were eradicated in the 1980s, but unfortunately during the time that they were present, there was a lot of soil erosion on the island, which meant that a lot of the hardwood uh, plant species, in particular the palms, uh, declined. Um, so luckily these were eradicated and this has allowed the plant community to be restored. And Round Island is actually one of the longest running island restoration projects in the world. Um, the eradication of the goats and rabbits allowed the palm community to come back, but there were still issues with invasive uh, plants and weeds. So if you've heard of Round Island, you might know that they had uh, tortoises introduced. So this is the Aldabra tortoise, and these were introduced onto Round Island as an ecological replacement for the tortoises that were there previously. And Round Island is home to a lot of cool, unique species that aren't found anywhere else. Um, there's some really nice reptile species, the Gunther's gecko, Round Island boa, tail feather skink and the ornate day gecko. We've got two species of tortoise, the Aldabra tortoise and the radiated tortoise, both um, put on the island as the ecological replacements. And it's got um, globally important seabird populations. I think it holds the biggest uh, wedge-tailed shearwater colony in the Indian Ocean. Um, and then the most fascinating uh, seabed, seabed species, and maybe I'm slightly biased, um, is the round island petrel. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. So just a little bit of background, if you're not hugely familiar with uh, seabirds, but petrels are in the order Procellaria forms, and this contains some of your more well-known uh, species, such as the albatross, and some species that you might be more familiar with in the UK, such as the Mount Shearwater, the European Storm Petrel, and the Northern Fulmer. And the Round Island Petrel is a, a Pterodroma Petrel. Um, these are a few images of the Petrel. And Pterodroma basically stands for wing runner due to their weaving flight. And naturalists have been visiting Round Island since the 1800s, but it wasn't actually until 1948 that the Round Island petrel was um, first discovered breeding. It's believed that the colonisation of the Round Island petrel was caused by the deforestation of the island, so there being less plants, meaning there's more bare ground um, for the petrels to nest on, and also poaching of red-tailed tropic birds um, they can be quite aggressive, um, so it's likely that they would have been competing for nest sites. But the Round Island Petrel was originally identified as a Trinidad Petrel, and Trinidad Petrel um, is it's only, or previously, it's only known to believe Sorry, it was only known to breed on Trinidad Island, and this is in the South Atlantic. And you can see from the map, the star is Round Island, that they're separated by 9,000 kilometers. And they've also got um, the African continent in the middle as well. But the Round Island petrel has been quite confusing taxonomically and later visits by ornithologists started to question the taxonomy as to if it was actually a Trinidad petrel. And they heard calls which were similar to that of the Kermadec petrel. And this species um, native range is broadly in the Pacific. So you can see from the map here. And then even more confusingly, um, in the 1990s, they found another small, quite pale species 
and this is the Herald petrol. Um, and this was actually confirmed um, that there were Herald petrels on Round Island because a bird ringed on Rain Island in Australia as a Herald petrel breeding as an adult in 1984 was actually caught on Round Island breeding as an adult in 2006 to 2012. So there's quite good evidence to show that they're moving um, between islands. And genetic analyses has shown that the population on Round Island is actually a hybrid population containing at least these three species. So my PhD is based on uh, the Round Island petrel um, and this has been a, quite a long term project and I'm going to split it up into a few um, sections to talk about. The first one being uh, genetics. So all individuals that are ringed have their blood sampled. Um, tracking using geolocators to look at their movements during the breeding and non-breeding period. And also nest monitoring and ringing to look at breeding productivity and survival. But first, seeing as I told you that the hybrids, I thought I'd talk a little bit more about their genetics. And this was mainly based on a PhD done um, a few years ago by someone called Catherine Booth Jones. And it wasn't sure, but people weren't sure originally if Round Island was a area where birds came to hybridize or if birds were hybridizing across the whole um, Indian Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. But it wasn't until Kat did her PhD that she actually found that there was hybrids across all oceans. Um, so rather than acting as a secondary contact point, um, hybrids were a lot more common elsewhere. Just Round Island has the highest proportion of hybrids. Um, so I won't go too much into that, but there is a really neat paper if you want to learn any more about the genetics of the petrels. And then one part of my PhD um, is based on tracking. Um, so the petrels are fitted with these geolocators um, and they're fitted on these colourings that go on the bird's legs. And if you're not familiar with geolocators, you have you let the bird go, you have to let the bird go off on its migration. And you can't do a remote download, you actually have to capture or capture the bird and get the tag back again in order to get your data. So that's me looking very happy because you're normally quite happy when you find a bird that had a tag on. And then these geolocators, um, light level geolocators, they record the light levels in, and they give you two um, locations per day. And they do this because if you know the day length, you can calculate the latitude. And if you know when solar noon is or solar midnight, then you can figure out longitude. And by using the light data and stuff like um, sea surface temperatures, you can pinpoint where the birds are. Um, so 421 geolocators have been deployed on adult petrels since 2009. And from this, we've gotten 263 complete migration tracks of 196 individuals. And this has also provided us with repeat tracks over two, three or four years for 62 birds. So where are the birds going? Um, Round Island on this map is the yellow triangle. And you can see that petrol migrations are covering different areas across much of the Indian Ocean. Birds are going north to the Arabian Sea, some to the Bay of Bengal, others over to the Western Australian Basin, and quite a few stay more in the centre of the Indian Ocean and around Round Island. And interestingly, um, two birds were actually recorded to leave the Indian Ocean. Um, so here, the stars Round Island, the points, the uh, circles and the crosses represent two different birds. And you can see that they're going one towards the Atlantic Ocean and one towards the Pacific Ocean. And the different symbols here, the square is Trinidad Island. So this is where the Trinidad Petrel's uh, native island is. Uh, the diamond just above Australia is uh, Rain Island. And that's where the Herald Petrel that was ringed and then found on Round Island came from. And then the triangle is Lord Howe Island. 
So this is kind of showing like how like the potential connectivity of these isolated populations and how gene flow might potentially be occurring. And then part of my PhD, I've been looking at where the birds are going on their migration. So the map I showed you a minute ago, you could see that the points covered the basically like most of the Indian Ocean, but certain individuals tend to go to certain places. So here I've got three examples um, of three different petrels. Uh, petrel one, so just to explain, so this is a heat map and the yellow's got, um, that's like a stronger density of points and then the closer to blue it is, the less points there are. Um, so yeah, petrel one's going over towards the Western Australian basin, petrel two up to the Arabian Sea and petrel three's got more of a central Indian Ocean range. So this is showing that there's a large between individual variation and birds are going to different places. But when we look at birds that we've got more than one year of tracking data for, you can see that the same birds are going to the same places. So petrel one's still going over to the Western Australian basin. And yeah, they're following the similar pattern. So they have very little within individual variation. So basically individuals are going to different places, but they're going to the same place in different years. And we've also found this to be them leaving and coming back to Round Island at the same time. And considering these petrels breed all year round, it's quite remarkable that they'll do the same thing year after year. So that's the genetics and tracking. Um, so now I'll go on to nest monitoring and ringing. Um, so this has been going on since the early 1990s. A few birds were ringed before this, uh, but not in huge numbers. Um, but yeah, they've been ringing since the 1990s and they've been doing routine surveys since 2002 when the field station was built. And the nest monitoring and ringing includes going out across the whole of Round Island to where we know the petrels to breed, looking at all the petrel nest sites and recording what's in the nest sites. So the nest sites tend to be under rocky ledges, around boulders, um, sometimes in long grass or under bushes. They nest in quite a variety of places. And we go out and record if a petrel's there, if they're just resting, if they're incubating an egg, if there's a chip. And then if we're lucky enough to catch an adult because they they can be quite difficult to catch. If they see you coming, they might fly off. Then we might be able to ring it. Or if it's already ringed, we can record this as a recapture and we can look at survival rates from this. But when we catch them, um, we do all the morphometric measurements to take weights. Um, we take the blood samples for the genetic analysis that I mentioned earlier. And if we're putting geolocator tags on, this is when we might do it as well. And from this um, nest monitoring, so this um, has been done every month or more recently, every two months. Um, and from someone called Vikash, who did his PhD on the petrels, we found that the petrels breed all year round. And we've also found there to be a peak in egg laying between August and October. So this plot here shows the number of petrel chicks recorded in each month and the grey blocks represent the annual cyclone season. So Round Island has two um, seasons, we've got the austral winter and the austral summer. And we found that the highest hatching success is actually in the off-peak period um, in the austral winter. So this might be um, quite surprising considering there's less attempts going on, that there's actually a higher success um, of hatching and fledging. But overall, the round island petrel actually has quite a low breeding success, especially when compared to other petrels or similar petrels on other islands when they don't have invasive predators. But what might cause nests to fail and when? Um, this is one thing that we don't have a huge amount of evidence for, um, but it could be to do with 
petrol petrol competition for nest sites, or they might be competing with um, other species such as the red tailed tropic bird. They did say it could be quite aggressive, but um, thankfully these images were from camera traps and I can tell you that that chick was fine afterwards. Um, there's also all these other species on the island. This is a telfair skink that I captured trying to eat this egg. And there's also uh, the round island boa that's been recorded to eat a tropic bird chick, so I'm sure it could take a petrel chick as well. Um, and round islands, a tropical island, it can get very hot. Um, birds, you normally find them moving out of the um, sun and into the shade, so there's chances that chicks might overheat or eggs potentially as well if they're left um, unincubated. And then the fact that the birds are hybrids, we don't know how much of an influence this is having on the success of the eggs. Um, lots of hybrid species, the eggs or offspring are infertile. So this could be one reason as to why nests are failing, because obviously this is a fluffy petrel chick and that's not its egg. Um, and with these monthly or bi-monthly surveys, it's really difficult to follow individual petrol breeding attempts. Um, so I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, and because the petrels all nest on the ground, um, it can be quite difficult to tell what egg belongs to who or what chick belongs to who, especially when you only go around every month. So one thing which we could do is go around and check nests every day. But obviously, this would be very time consuming and would cause a lot of disturbance to the birds. So one potential option is to use cameras. Um, so you can use uh, cameras, time lapse cameras that you set up in the field and they take images at set intervals. So this is what I did. Um, I went out to Round Island in 2019. Um, my first task was actually trying to get the materials that I needed onto the island um, because boat rides and walking up and down the um, steep slopes weren't easy. Um, but I had a lot of help um, and I can say thanks to Joe. and I know you're here, Joe. Um, so thank you for helping me to deploy these camera stands. So we had to choose materials that would withstand the high salt and moisture levels. We also had to make sure that the cameras would be securely fixed to the ground um, with the monsoons or cyclones um, that can go across the island. Uh, we had to make sure that they wouldn't move or get blown away. Um, and luckily, um, I have been told that from the past few cyclones that have gone over around that the cameras are still there. So I think I did a good job. So I deployed um, 10 cameras onto Round Island. It's just a few photos because I'm proud of my hard work. And yeah, so 10 cameras were deployed on Round Island and these are the locations. So we've got the different colored points represent different uh, nest site colonies and the red triangles are the 10 cameras. So you can see that they're focused on the green and yellow points and this is because I chose the cameras to focus on nest sites that had um, good historical productivity. So I chose sites that I knew had been used previously in the past in the hope that birds would use these sites again and I'd be able to capture this on camera. And each camera looks at multiple nest sites. So in order to increase the sample size of the number of nests that we're looking at, it was a bit of a balance in trying not to be too close to the cameras, uh, too close to the nest, sorry, um, but not too far away so that you could actually see what was going on. And each camera was programmed to take one image every hour. Um, and I just put this here because I've been told that the cameras have actually got these ornate day geckos nesting on them. So I thought that was quite nice. So yeah, one image every hour means that I've got a lot of camera photos and 
The issue now is trying to turn this wealth of photographic information into a data set that I can use to answer my research questions, trying to figure out um, what's causing nests to fail and when. Um, and this is where I need you um, to help me count petrels. So this is the virtual bird counting at Seabird Watch. And the idea is that e these images are uploaded onto Seabird Watch and citizen scientists click on the images to identify adult petrels, which I'm highlighting here, and also two fluffy petrel chicks. So thankfully for me, Seabird Watch um, was already set up. So I'm very grateful to Tom Hart and Mark Jessup who started up this project. Uh, Tom is a penguinologist at the University of Oxford. It's a very cool title. And Mark Jessup is a lecturer at University College Cork. And Seabird Watch was initially set up to monitor kittiwakes and guillemots across the North Atlantic. So they're working with people that have cameras in Iceland, Faroes, Greenland, um, in the UK, in Wales, and yeah, all across the North Atlantic. And their research aims are quite similar to mine. They want to look at egg and chick survival and breeding success, um, and how this varies uh, spatially at the different uh, colonies. They want to look at causes of egg and chick mortality, whether it's predators or um, abandonment by the parents. And they also want to record the timing of breeding and how this varies at different spatial scales. So I'm very grateful to them for allowing me to host my Round Island Petrol images on their website. So this is uh, the Seabird Watch website. Um, I put the link at the top, seabirdwatch.org. And this is hosted on the Zooniverse platform, um, which has lots of other uh, citizen science projects. So we can go on this website and we can learn more. Um, and you can go on there to find out about um, the project and what our research aims are, where the cameras are, who we are, the team working um, behind Seabird Watch. There's also a really good talk section where all the volunteers who are classifying these images, um, where they share the things they're finding, or you can ask questions on there if you're stuck. And there's a really good team there who will help you out. And depending on what you'd like to look at, you can look at the uh, kittiwakes or guillemots under the time lapse option. Or obviously, I'm going to tell you to look at the round island petrels in that option. And once you click on the Round Island Petrels, it will bring up this page. So if you've not um, signed up or you're just starting out, there's a really handy tutorial on there that you can go through and it will basically tell you how this works and what you need to do. And if you're not sure, I've circled where the tutorial option is if you need to go back to it. So this tells you that we're looking we need your help to monitor seabird colonies and we need you to click on what you're seeing in the images, if these are adults, chicks, eggs or something else. Um, each tutorial is specific to each workflow. So here we're looking at round island petrels. And we're also interested in looking at their eggs and chicks. But you might also be lucky enough to spot the other inhabitants of round island. And there's also a field guide if you're not, if you want some more information on the petrels or more images, then you can go on to there and you can learn more about the petrels and you can get to that whenever you're on this page. So here um, I've circled the things that we would like people to classify. So adults, chicks, eggs or others, and you can use these individual markers to click on the different things you're seeing. So here we've got two adults at the front that I've used um, with the adult clicker and also an adult at the back. And it's as simple as that as clicking on the birds and then pressing done when you're finished with that image. Um, so you'll be shown any one of the random uh, or any one of the 10 cameras, a random image, and you'll go through those. And here we've got four adults all at the back and we can click on those 
and there's a chick at the front as well. So hopefully I'm showing to you that it's quite a simple process to do and just to show you how easy the eggs are to be seen there's an egg there and a fluffy chick and there's also other useful two tools on the website so if you need to zoom in you can use the plus sign here so you can go in to get a better look at the image and there's two adult petrels there. And then these are just some images from the camera traps um, and lots of the volunteers on Zooniverse have been tagging these so you can see the images on the website. We've got white-tailed tropic birds and red-tailed tropic birds, tail fair skinks and tortoises. They're all quite common on the camera traps as well as the petrels. So basically, if you can click, you can tag a petrel. It's as simple as that. And if you can do that, you can really help us in identifying at what stage petrol nests are failing and why. Is it the egg stage or the chick stage? And hopefully we'll be able to tell if it's due to the hybridization, sorry, <laughs> the hybridization um, being the issue or predators. Um, hopefully we can look more into the seasonal variation in nesting attempts and breeding success and be able to relate this to the breeding and migration movements, timings and genetics of the petrol population and be able to get this bigger picture. And ultimately, if this works, we can use the method for other uh, ground nesting seabirds. So if you'd be interested in helping, and I'd really appreciate it, you can go to Seabird Watch and you can follow me on Twitter and ask me questions there if you need anything else. That's great, Kirsty. Thank you so much. Um, here on In Conservation, we're very, very keen to uh, support and to promote uh, citizen science. Um, but I've learned a couple of things. I mean, for example, penguinologist. I've never heard of a penguinologist before. I think it's a great word, by the way. Um, I think it's great. The other thing I learned is that if I need to have some camera stands built, I'm getting you in. I can try. <laughs> and uh, and Zooniverse is also a great word. Um, I don't know if you uh, or any of the Zoomers are familiar, but um, there used to be a series, a comedy series called The Mighty Boosh. And uh, the, the two characters in there, Neil, uh, Noel Fielding and I forgot the other guy's name, Julian, whatever, they were zookeepers in a zoo called the Zooniverse. And that's back in the, I think back in the the 90s or early 2000s. So a little bit of uh, background there. <coughs> Excuse me, I was gonna ask you actually, um, have you been to Round Island? Obviously you have. Um, how long do you stay for and where do you stay? Is there accommodation on the island? Uh, yeah, so there's a field station on the island and it has pretty much everything you need. You've got your kitchen and workspace. I guess the only thing you don't have is a shower um, but I slept in a tent on Round Island, which was very nice because you've got all the bird noises around you. Um, but you normally spend uh, two weeks or a month at a time, um, and then you'll come off, go back to the mainline, mainland and have some normal life, and then you go back again afterwards. So I was out there for about three months in total in the end of 2019. Okay. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say, I noticed that your dog was very fascinated in you in certain parts of the talk. He oh, was, really? Oh, yeah. He's behind you, egging you on and also looking at the screen um, at certain parts of the talk, um, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. Now, as a birder, and I'm talking about myself here now, as a birder, I'm a little bit disappointed knowing that a lot of the petrels and shearwaters could potentially be hybrids because us birders like to have things in boxes. That's definitely that, that's whatever. And I was a bit dis dismayed to hear that. Yeah, they're not easy. <laughs> I mean, lots of them aren't easy to identify in the field. Um, I think that's why they had so much difficulty in the first few years after identifying the birds being on Round Island as they just look so similar. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but um, what is the future for, for hybrids if, 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 if they are infertile? Does that mean that 
eventually that population is going to die out? Um, no, they, there are some like pure trindade types and pure permadeck types. So if those species breed with their own species, then hopefully the population will be fine. Um, I mean, it's increasing at the moment. Um, the population on Round Island is doing quite well, like even though there is this low breeding success. Um, so hopefully at the moment, the future looks okay for the petrels. So the hybridization is that caused because there's the kind of limits of each species kind of meeting in this place and they can't find enough of their own partners. Is that why, why it's happening? Or are Round Island petrels the most, prom- the most predominant um, with the other two coming in as almost like vagrants in a way and, and not, fa- not finding partners and breeding with, round, with um, pure Round Island petrels? Is that how it's working? Uh, yeah, so I'm not 100% sure what's driving it. Um, so I call them Round Island petrels, but it's not a species. It's just what the population is called on Round Island. Um, so it's mainly the Trindade from the Atlantic um, on there. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure what's driving it because most seabirds, um, you know them as being quite sight faithful and they will breed where they're born. So the fact that these birds are clearly leaving their native ranges and coming to Round Island is quite intriguing. Um, but I'm not sure why they're doing it. And in terms of the actual population on the island, what is the, how many birds are you talking about in terms of pairs? Do you know? Uh, oh, I'm not 100% sure. In the thousands, um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what the numbers okay. are. And in terms of their uh, predators, obviously you, you in your talk you showed that they compete with, potentially compete with birds like the red-tailed tropic bird and also could be potentially gobbled up by the boa and lizards. But do you know anything about their mortality rate once they leave the nest? As in out at sea? Yeah. Um, not a huge amount, um, but the survival rate of the petrels is quite high. Um, I feel like it's in the 90s. Um, once quite... you become an adult. Uh, once you be... yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's amazing how such small birds can traverse such enormous distances. I mean, looking at the, the map you showed and birds going up to the, the Persian Sea or over to Australia, I mean, that is no mean feat, as well as being in some adverse weather conditions. Um, out of interest, you as a, as a scientist, are you actually also looking at birds in terms of like you know do you, do you have a list of seabirds that you've seen or is it just you're working on that particular thing and you have a general love for the for the group uh, are you asking me if i'm a lister <laughs> well i wasn't trying to be that blunt but maybe yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i will take note of what i've seen but <laughs> okay and in the camera traps have you ever seen anything that was a bit kind of rare? Um, nothing rare yet, um, but more just surprising in the fact that we've had like crabs taking eggs out of nests. You can see them like moving them away. Um, yeah, so nothing exciting yet, but there are other species of petrel that come to Round Island. Um, like the black winged petrel and the bulbous petrel. So fingers crossed that we'll capture those on there as well. Okay, so when someone actually um, signs up for this, um, how much time are you talking about in terms of them, be, you know, in terms of a, an average count, for example? How, how long would that take? Or is it as long as a piece of string? Yeah, as long as a piece of string, you could go on there and do one photo and it takes you 30 seconds um, or you could go on there and do a hundred photos. Um, yeah, it's completely up to the participant. Okay. Um, at this stage, um, I've got a, a question actually from Shailesh Patel and I'm going to bring you in early Shailesh so you can ask the question yourself. 
Good evening to you, by the way. Good evening to you. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm all right, actually, not bad. I like your black wing stilt behind you, very nice. Oh, thank you, David. Uh, I mean, I can ask the question after 8 o'clock. What do you mean to ask that question uh, now? Yeah, ask it now, yeah. Let's let's break it. Let's, let's shake it up a bit. Let's have a bit of a oh, difference. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, very interesting talk you gave about, um, you know, uh, seabirds. I have a question for you. Now your research, is it being funded by Bud Life or any NGOs? Uh, yes, yeah, so my PhD is funded by the British Ornithologists Union. Um, so this was by a scholarship um, and it was actually money left behind by John and Pat Warham, um, who did a lot of research on Procellaria forms and penguins. Um, and then I'm also supported by the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, the Mauritian government when I'm in Mauritius. Oh, okay, thank you. I mean, David, sorry, I have a few questions. Can I finish now, please, if you don't mind? Oh, you don't know asking more questions. Yeah, can I ask her now, or is it after eight o'clock? Well, I can ask another question, yeah. Oh, thank you. Now, I was looking at your your bird skulls, which you have on your window field. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, do, do you know which bird, I mean, can you tell me which bird species are they from? Oh, I, I can't remember the exact species, but I've got an albatross here. These are, they're not mine. Um, <clears throat> wow, well, cool. okay. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> uh, I think this one's a great black back girl. In the oh, UK. I see. Okay. Oh, <laughs> good collection. Yeah. I'm really not sure. These are tiny ones. <laughs> Maybe someone here knows. No idea. <laughs> uh, other thing was, you know, um, you are lucky that you just did your research just before the lockdown. 2019 or end of 2019 i mean 2020 was a bad year for all of us now when you when you went into to the round island in mauritius did you have did you had any other researcher from mauritius as well did i what sir did you had any other researcher from from the mainland mauritius um researchers yes um so there's like wardens and volunteers on Round Island um, who were there all the time, so they were out there. Um, but I'm not sure if any of them were Mauritian. Oh, okay. No, I just wanted to know if, if you're getting any updates, you know, from your research. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, there's a team on the island all the time, um, apart from a few months during when like COVID was at its peak in Mauritius. Um, so they're out there working and they transfer back the images. Um, so I get lots of updates from them. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank All right, you, David. Well, thank you very much, Shailesh, and uh, see you on the other side, as they say. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so question for you, uh, Kirsty, is um, what is your favorite bird? It's going to have to be, it's a seabird, um, but it's going to have to be the European storm petrel. Um, just because that's how I got into birds. Um, that was the species that amazed me the most. They're so small, they're about 26 grams and they fly so far. Um, and they make really cute noises. <laughs> um, so yeah, it has to be that. It's funny, I know so many British birders who have not seen a storm petrel at all. And they're not easy to see either. I mean, they're tiny anyway. Even if they flew past you, you might not even see them. Yeah, I've been quite lucky that I've been out to islands. Um, if you can get out to Skokum Island or somewhere like that, then you've got a good chance of seeing them. Yeah. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, um, notwithstanding the current pandemic, where would you be? It's going to seem a bit funny because I've just spoken about it, but Round Island, <laughs> just you're in the middle of the Indian Ocean and you've got petrels flying over you at night. You've got sheer waters making such weird noises. Um, yeah, so definitely Round Island. And it's nice and hot. <laughs> well, it sounds it. How big is it? 
how long how long would it take you to walk around it um quite a while but that's probably because the terrain's not so great um but i think it's 219 hectares i think it's the largest mauritian island i believe okay cool Okay, uh, Zoomers, just to uh, let you know what's happening in the coming days and weeks. Um, on Monday next week, we have um, someone else from an island, um, this time Malta, Alice Tribe, and she'll be talking about the hunting that goes on there and how she and others are trying to save the birds in Malta. So that's on Monday next week, March the 1st at 7pm. On uh, Thursday, next Thursday, the 4th of March, I can't believe, actually, that's not next week, is it? Sorry, the week after next, sorry. <laughs> I thought I was acting, uh, going ahead of myself a bit. The week after next, that's the 1st of March. And so on Thursday, the 4th of March, um, we have Silas Olofsson, who's a resident of the Faroe Islands, and he'll be talking about birding on the Faroe Islands. And on Thursday, the 11th of March, we have Joe Harkness, he of Bird Therapy fame, the book that talked about his battle with mental health. He'll be here on March the 11th um, to talk about uh, that sort of stuff and, and, and nature and birding and how that's going to get, or how that got him through his dark times. And also, um, as I said earlier, on March the 18th, we have um, the one and only um, Margaret Atwood, of course, so uh, that would be fantastic. So please, um, if you're watching this, um, get involved with this interesting seabird count on Round Island. Hit the website. It's all on the actual, um, on the chat, but it's also here with the, uh, um, if you read back and look at the, um, the, the presentation, the Seabird Watch, check it out and get involved and do some virtual counting, some virtual ornithology, and help out not only Kirsty's PhD, but help out in our knowledge of what's going on in the world. So Kirsty, I wish you luck, and thank you so much for sparing your evening to come and talk to us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Good, I'm glad you did. And Zoomers, um, again, thank you guys for, for being here tonight. It's really nice of you to turn up and by the way, tonight, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's just left for me to say, take care of yourselves in this very, you know, these very difficult times. But more importantly, keep looking up. <laughs>